Welcome everyone. I'm Jerome Rankin, board member for the Kingfield Neighborhood Association. So the folks at KFNA, you know, we like to brag a little bit about how talented and committed our Kingfield community is. And I think this is a good time as any to help everyone in the neighborhood learn more about the cool things our neighbors are up to. So you can do your own bragging, but mostly so we can get to know each other a little better. I think that is even more vitally important now uh, as we're doing this physical distancing, which will probably be extended for a little while longer. Um, but we're not really social distancing. We're trying to get more socially connected uh, while we're forced to be physically apart. Um, and understanding what drives and fulfills our neighbors can help build and strengthen that connection between us. So uh, this is our second installment of this series and we're excited uh, to welcome Victoria Pena. Victoria, welcome. Hello, thank you. Thanks for having me, Jerome. This is really Excellent. exciting. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, where in the neighborhood are you and how long you've been in Kingfield? Um, I live on the 3600 block of First Avenue South and I have been a homeowner here um, since about 2007, but my family has been on the block for four generations. No so way! We've been on the same block since before 1939 with my great-grandmother purchasing a house um, two doors down from me. Um, so I have family on the block and um, our family and friends, you know, like call it the compound. <laughs> so sure, we've got sure. cousins and relatives and <laughs> You know, grandma's house now has, um, you know, like my sister living in it. Um, so we've been here a really long time. Yeah. That's incredible. You must have some amazing stories of just neighborhood change in your family, about seeing things come and go uh, and how things have developed over the course of several decades. Yeah, my mother passed away um, and it's her side of the family. So my uncle is the one that I, um, I pick his brain a lot. And he tells me stories about when our backyard was the city dump. So I find all <laughs> kinds of treasures in there, um, all, all kinds of um, good stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about what you do for work. So right now my job is a youth career um, pathway coordinator and I stutter because it doesn't necessarily reflect all of the pieces that I do. Sure. Um, I work for Project for Pride and Living, um, which is primarily a housing um, organization, mm -hmm. but back in, I believe, 2008, they um, collaborated and started taking on education in the form of alternative programming for um, high schoolers. So, um, that's what I do. I uh, was at an alternative high school, one of those schools for a decade, um, working as a staff at uh, Loring Nicollet Alternative School. Okay. And then um, took a leave of absence, uh, left for a few years out to the East Coast and came back and uh, was in a role working with our PSEO students at the community college at Minneapolis College. And um, now my job is kind of shifting as our world shifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to ask some questions about that too in a bit. Um, but so I hear in these in these these roles that you've had, the common thread being you're working with kids and young people. Um, what brought you to that line of work? What led you to that? Ah, uh, wow, that's a good question. Um, I was a, we used to call them at risk youth, and mm. um, there's a lot of like negative um you know stuff that go with those that language um, yeah but uh childhood was not exactly easy for me um and so uh there were quite a few barriers once i got to high school and um when traditional school didn't work out after being at south high for three out of the four years um i ended up bouncing around to um co uh, different charter programs and finally ended up at an alternative program mm -hmm. and um along the way i had taught at uh, heart of the beast over the summertime and was always plugged into youth work um, sure. in some shape or form. And then after my experience as a student, um, as an alternative student, I felt that once I graduated, um, it was something that I just uh, didn't want to let go of, of um, uh, being able to support young people. Um, when I needed that support, um, people were able to show up for me and mentor me and bolster me into my next chapter of my yeah. life. And um, I felt a deep tie 
to being able to provide that space and help um, advocate for it to become a more clear and robust channel and um, dialogue with our community. Yeah. Are there any lessons or experiences uh, from when you were young and there were people around you forming that support system that you now get to sort of mirror in your work that you do today? Wow, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I suppose being able to focus on um, validating and seeing um, myself as a person of color um, yeah. in curriculum is uh, very, very important and yeah. allows the um, the spiritual unrest uh, to uh, be, you know, it, it eases that. So um, anytime that a adult or a teacher can uh, give the lens of the um, group of the oppressed or mm. um, give a different channel than um, the traditional, yeah. um, um, you know, white lens that we have um, seen that uh, curriculum was traditionally built upon um, can be very validating and motivating. So I think any opportunity that we have to do that, um, I, I get excited about that when I see that in other educators. That's great. Uh, you know, one thing when I, when I talk to people in education, uh, I ask this question a lot. The work that you do, a lot of it, some of it is immediate, right? Some of it, there's a child with, a, with an immediate need that you're able to address. But a lot of it is sort of like watching the long arc of development and, and, and change in someone's life. Mm -hmm. How do you stay motivated and like energized knowing that like sometimes you're not going to see the immediate results that kind of come with other kind of careers? Wow, that's really good. Um, there's a lot of different ways that that has to happen. And I think it's being able to mark the moments, the small gifts that we have of um, each individual student's growth, of um, them being able to show up one day, um, them being able to, maybe you see a smile on them for the first time. Um, or maybe, you know, something even bigger that they, um, they get into college or being able to um, mark those moments. We don't take enough time to mm. say like, oh, I've arrived. None of us are able to do that. We're constantly chasing instead sure. of being able to say that, wow, this moment right here is really important. And um, each little game each day. Um, so I think that that gives me hope. Yeah. Um, and is able to help me see that there is going to be an end goal or that it is making a difference in this one life and that that's enough for today. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. Um, so you've been in this work for a while. Uh, what has changed um, either in how you approach it or in sort of how you've seen like the field in general uh, approach the kind of work you do? Um, I believe that we are uh, able to use a lot more of the tools uh, that are available to us. So yeah. as traditional school houses crumble <laughs> mm -hmm. and shift and mm -hmm. change um, and become more dynamic uh, and global or however you want to say that, um, that they're not locked into brick and mortar. It's um, opening up lots of different opportunities for um, experiential learning. So um, being able to tie things that uh, young people are interested in or doing outside of the traditional school building back into the lessons that they need to learn and the things that um, need to fall into place for them to earn a traditional diploma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got about five minutes left and I don't see any questions popping up yet, but I implore you if you're watching live and I know a few of you are, if you have any questions for Victoria, please drop them in the chat. Otherwise, I will continue to monopolize your time and ask all the questions that I have here. Um, I do have a, a one I want to ask. Um, so we are not in normal times. Um, and fortunately, we may be at this long enough that it will start to feel normal. I'm not quite ready for that yet, uh, but we're getting there. Um, so what are you thinking about in terms of how we're caring for our children during this crisis and the things that we need to be thinking about? Uh, so I think what 
is happening right now is that the adults of the world have had the rump pulled out from underneath them and that young people are actually a lot more resilient than we are and that they are really our teachers right now mm -hmm. and um they are more savvy with technology and a lot more versatile and um, are going to be able to bounce back and be strong and ready to uh, give back and be plugged in. And that it's our job right now to um, kind of get over the dishevelry that this has caused in our adult brains that the world has been this way forever and all of a sudden the rules are have been thrown out the window yeah. and give them an opportunity to lead us into that. Mm -hmm. um, to, to listen to what it is that they need and um, what is actually possible. And yeah. that all of the, uh, so many things that weren't possible before are, it's this open landscape that we are allowed to dream and breathe life into the right areas and start paying attention to the yeah. things that really matter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and what kind of things are you hearing um, that, that children are need at this, at this time? Are you, getting some kind of feedback that makes you think that there's a, a general idea about what kids could could benefit from right now? Yeah, I think that every young person is suffering again from those um, those those things being canceled. There's no prom, there's no, um, and so for the population that I work with that um, the opportunity youth uh, that are in non-traditional settings that have multiple challenges in their lives to have um, everything else closed, that there's no summer job, there's no summer camp, there's no internships, or um, you can't even go and play basketball right now. Um, so I believe that the mental health and spiritual grounding and interconnectedness needs to be the priority right now. Yeah. And that we have um, plenty of things that we're doing there's still mechanics working and there's still people in gardens and there's still um, midwives with knowledge that are ready to share that. And that it's our job right now to make those connections and plug them in and help with that skill building that again, doesn't fit traditional hmm. um, um, lessons learned to get a diploma, but that it's our job to show up for our young people and make space and time for them and yep. be able to, um, show them that we do care and we do see them and value their gifts and we're ready to help them polish um, so that they're ready to give back and feel supported. Absolutely. That's really great. I, I have a uh, nine-year-old and a five-year-old at home who are both sort of struggling with this uh, in their own individual ways. Yeah. Uh, and so it is just good to hear another reminder of uh, my responsibility to listen to them, allow them to sort of share that pain um that i know they're feeling uh and and also just give them the space to process it in the way they need to so i really appreciate that from a very personal level hopefully folks out there uh who have of kids can can use that stuff as well i appreciate that um we are about a time i'm not seeing any questions out there uh, is there anything else you want to you want to share with us before we sign off uh, no, just I think that uh, each one of us can um, breathe hope into those spaces. So we all are talented and whole human beings and um, that interconnection again is the biggest key in this world that we're living in in COVID. So um, looking for opportunities every day to be present and to plug in and connect is probably the best that we can all do right now. Like we're doing right now. Like we're doing right now, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, we are gonna be plugging in and connecting again next week at the same time. So uh, folks who join us live, please join us live again next week. Uh, and um, you know, we'll be doing more connecting and plugging in as we go uh, over the next several weeks. So thanks again, all who are here. Thanks, Victoria. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Jerome. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.